this direction like you're putting your hands in your pocket. So the fibers go between, both of these are going to go between the ribs, but the external intercostals move anteriorly as they go to the lower rib. And then the internal intercostals, in this case they talk, the, the origin insertion change because one, you know, the origin, the insertion moves towards the origin. So in this case we're talking about the origin is the rib below, and then it's going to go posterior and superior direction. All right, it's going to go this direction here. Okay, so as this moves, it runs in this direction. Okay. So external is like you put your hands in your pocket, internal is the other way like this. And then the other muscle of respiration, which is probably the most important one, at least especially in the inspiration part, is the diaphragm. Right. So when the diaphragm contracts, what's it going to do? If it's like if it's shaped like a parachute, so it's like this or like a bowl. Okay. If it contracts, is it going to go up like this or down like yeah. that? Down again. So it's down like that. So when it contracts down, what's going to happen to the, air, to the lung, or air? Yes. Air is going to get pulled into the lung. Okay. So that's important for inspiration. And so basically the origin is all the way around the outside edge here. So the inferior internal surface of the rib cage and the sternum, the coastal cartilage of the ribs, and then the bodies of the lumbar vertebra. So it's basically all around the perimeter is the origin, and then it inserts onto itself. So the insertion is all up here onto, onto itself. Okay. And then you, you understand the difference when we talk about diaphragmatic breathing versus chest breathing? So if somebody's doing more chest breathing, what are you going to see moving more on their body? So you're going to expand more in the chest here. And then as you inhale, what are you going to see in the abdomen with diaphragmatic breathing? Is the belly going to go out or in? So as the diaphragm goes down, it restricts the area where the abdominal organs are, so they're going to come out. So here's a view of the diaphragm from down below, and then here's the central tendon that it inserts upon itself. And then why does it have these openings in it? Um, yeah. There's three different kinds of things that have to go through there. Okay, you have to have blood, and you also have to uh, have the digestive. You have well, two things are related to blood, actually. One is going to be for the aorta, and then one for the esophagus of the digestive tract, and then one for the vein for the vena cava. Okay, so blood's coming up through there, which is the venous blood, and then arterial blood's going down. And the aorta is the one that's closest to the spine right here, and then the esophagus is kind of in between, and then more anteriorly you're gonna have the uh, inferior vena cava. So now we get into the abdominal muscles. So does anybody know any names of the abdominal muscles? What would be the name for the one that goes straight down the middle? Rectus abdominis. Rectus meaning straight, abdominis meaning abdominal. Okay? And then you're going to have an external one, which means if you say external, then there's going to be an opposing one, which will be what? <laughs> internal. And the, the word oblique means that it runs at an angle. And then we're going to have a, another one that's going to be transverse abdom transversus abdominis, which is going to run the transverse plane. Although some of these muscles, they may start out running in one direction, and they may change as they pan out. Like the transverse abdominis 
and the midsection is going to be more straight like this, but as it comes down here, it might it's going to run more in this type of a direction. So what they do is they form their thumb on the wall, and they're also involved in flexion of the trunk, and then lateral flexion and or rotation, depending on if they're acting unilaterally. And then they also have to do with urination, defecation, childbirth, anything where you have to bear down, right? People, women are giving birth once they're ready. It's okay, bear down, right? Push. So it's used to expel the baby or other bodily functions. And then coughing and stinging, sneezing. So one of the things that we talked about in orthopedics, it's, there's a test that you do for increased intrathecal pressure. It's called valsalva maneuver. So what you do is you have the patient, you say, okay, take a deep breath in, hold it, and then bear down as if you're moving your bowels. So what you're doing is you're increasing, increasing the pressure throughout the spinal cord, the fluid that surrounds the spinal cord. So if somebody has either a tumor or something like a disc herniation or something like that, then they're going to have, maybe they may have pain. If it's a neck problem, they may have pain down their arm like that. Or if it's in the low back, they may have pain down the leg. Okay? So just when you remember later, you hear about the Salva maneuver, it's because you know, the abdominal muscles are contracting, <coughs> it's increasing pressure in the abdominal area, but that also transfers to the uh, fecal area, which is where it surrounds the spinal cord. So now this is a picture out of the book here that shows the different layers of the abdominal muscles. Right? So again, here we're starting up at the top, we have the serratus anterior, which is part of the uh, pelvic girdle, we'll talk about, I mean, uh, shoulder girdle, and we'll talk about that later. So then here, as you start, the most superficial is going to be, of course, the external oblique, or here they're showing it down here. Okay. So the external oblique here, and then in this case here, the actual belly of the muscle ends right there. And then there's a sheet of fascia that continues across it. Because what's going to happen is this, as these oblique muscles come across, they're going to form a sheet of fascia that's going to enclose the rectus abdominis. And we'll show a little bit better picture of that from different sections. But just understand that the belly of the muscle pretty much ends there, and it continues as a sheet of fascia. Part of that fascia goes in front of the rectus abdominis, and part of it goes behind. You see, here's the rectus abdominis that's been removed, and there's a, another fascia that goes behind it. Okay. So here's the external oblique, and then we have the internal oblique, and then those fibers are going to run this direction here, like this. Okay. Except for when you get down in this area here, because the external oblique fibers run like this, but then as you get farther down, you have the inguinal ligament right here, Okay. So and we don't have anything stripped away right there, but we show the maybe on the DVD we we'll show later is that these fibers as they come down here they end up running in this direction down here. So the fibers, the fibers are going to change their direction. The external oblique pretty much does stay the same because they can go down this way, and the internal oblique goes like this. Except when you get down here, it sort of has to fan out. Like And then you have the transverse abdominis, and that's going to go in the transverse plane. Right. And then as you can see, that's the deepest layer. And then here you have the rectus abdominis, that's going to go straight up and down. But it's split on either side, the front and back, with the fascia sheath that goes around it. And then here you have the inguinal ligament, and that's going to go from the part of the pelvis here, you have the iliac crest, and then the inguinal ligament comes from the iliac crest over to the pubic bone here. 